we're doing the same thing as an investigator. Uh, we're going to go out there and try to develop uh, leads as we're going along, as we look up one lead. And the worst thing that can happen to you is you run out of leads and the case is closed. What you've developed now is you've got the potential for looking at death certificates. We may still find people that are alive that can talk to us. Ever since I can remember, I have always found Frederick Delius's music deeply haunting, an outpouring of emotion in which I sense a special sadness, a longing for something or someone he had lost and was never to find again. For many years, I have believed that the unique quality in his music is connected in some deep way to a largely unknown period he spent in Florida as a young man. So I'm taking a break from my concert and recording schedule to become a detective. I'm going to try to unravel what is, I suspect, one of the greatest love stories in music never told. At this moment, I'm very, very excited because this is something that I've wanted to do for approximately 12 years. Now that we're going, it's like I always can't believe that we are going. I think when we actually step off the plane, I will believe it a little bit more. When Delius crossed the Atlantic by boat in 1884, aboard the Cunard liner Gallia, he was just 22. He was taking over an orange plantation in northern Florida in order to escape his overbearing father. Fritz, as he was then known, arrived at Solana Grove on the banks of the St. John's River in March he found that his plantation was in an inaccessible swamp, infested with mosquitoes and alligators. But surrounded only by nature and the former slaves who looked after the orange trees, he felt liberated and a closeness to the people. scholars dispute what really happened here. Many seem reluctant even to have it discussed. But I believe that the special quality in Delius's music is bound up with the experience he had here between 1884 and 85, the love affair of his life that came to nothing. It was with a black girl called Chloe, and after he left Solana Grove, she bore his son. Twelve years later, in 1897, he returned, but Chloe had fled fearing he would take the boy away, and Delius never found her or his son. Today, all trace of both the orange trees and the story seems to have been erased from the landscape. The site is tended by the Delius Association of Florida. The March Board Meeting of the Delius Festival of Florida will come to order. We welcome everyone. We particularly welcome our visitors from England, Miss Tasman Little. Madam President, and everybody else, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me to your meeting. I'm absolutely thrilled to see the good work that you do in promoting a composer that's very special to me. Um, the reason why I'm here is... I, I was surprised by the reaction of some of the members of the association of the when I explained to them the purpose of my visit. no evidence to substantiate the fact that he even fathered a child or anything about the romance, and I am not sure that this is a subject 
that would be dear to the hearts of our dearest members. Oh, I hope you find evidence. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> we don't all agree. <laughs> I first read of the love affair in an article by Percy Granger, composer and close friend of Delius, written shortly after Delius's death in 1934. When I wrote my graduation thesis on performing Delius, I repeated the story and found myself under fierce attack. So I phoned the late Dr Eric Fenby, to whom Delius dictated his works in later life, to ask him why Delius returned to Florida. Oh yes, there's no question about it, that he went there. Yes. Yeah, because there was a child. Yeah. And he went with the idea of persuading her to come back to Europe with him. Yes. Yeah. One of Delius's last works dictated to Fenby was The Idyll. It tells of two lovers who part, but years later yearn to meet again. All is over and long gone, but love is not over. Delius has been seen as the composer of a very English kind of pastoral music. No wonder the idea of him as a sexually active young man with a black mistress shocks some people. Yet so much of his experience in Florida is deeply embedded in the music. At Delius's house, lovingly removed from Solana Grove to the campus at Jacksonville University, I explained to a local reporter how my interest began while I was a student. I had by this time learnt Delius's violin concerto and it was beginning to dawn on me that there were certain elements in Delius's music but there was a feeling of nostalgia, a feeling of transience and this rather indefinable sense of harmony which set me thinking. I thought, you know, he doesn't sound like an English composer. What, what's going on here? And um, the fact remains that this feeling is in the music there must have been some experience that left him with this. I mean, he wasn't writing music like that before 1897. It was after 1897 that his sort of mature style of writing came um, into being. So something must have happened at that point in time. It was in 1897 that Delius recognised that he would probably never see Chloe again, or find his son. I started my search for proof by talking to Dr Thomas Gunn, who is in charge of the Delius collection at Jacksonville University. From our standpoint, I think we, you need to, to have some kind of documentation. You need to say, uh, there is an eyewitness account, uh, there is a, a something in a diary, something in a letter. Uh, perhaps on this side, of, of, uh, rather than, say, from Percy Granger. Yeah. Some, something from the tradition in the black family uh, that says, yes, our great-great-grandfather uh, was a white man who came from England. Uh, <clears throat> is there any kind of tradition like that? Uh, are there any kinds of records that you could uh, 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 say that this Chloe uh, had a child, uh, that she lived in or around near this area, my hunch was not enough. I needed a real detective. Lou Eliopoulos deals with unidentified homicides. Usually at the medical examiner's office, uh, we search for uh, lost loved ones all the time, trying to find next of kin, but this is kind of looking for the next of kin of the next of kin of the next of kin. <laughs> uh, so it, it goes past our usual resources that we would utilize with up-to-date computers. 
uh, you have a first name that's kind of unusual, that might help us. Uh, what we would try to do is, is look in the Bureau of Census that's, that's uh, computed by the Department of Commerce uh, on, a, um, on a decade basis right. and try to see if we can find out someone uh, with that name. That population base wasn't too dense uh, in this part during that time, so we, right. we have that in our favor. I was going to need help locating any census material that might survive from Delius's time. So I went to the Historical Society in St. Augustine, the nearest town to Solano Grove. Well, we do have a file on Delius if you'd like to look at it. Charles oh, yeah. Tingley is the librarian um, and very experienced at tracking the, uh, down lost family histories that, that and tracing family and trees. Unfortunately, many of the records that would have helped me find Delius's Chloe and their son had been destroyed years ago in a fire. Luckily, however, Charles had microfilm copies of a Florida State Census for 1885, the year that Delius was here. Someone from Georgia. So there's quite a bit of information, but that will vary from census to census. As you can see, sometimes the handwriting is difficult to read, so it's going to take quite a bit of time to search through this name by name to find your gal. All right? <laughs> Live from WAWS, this is Fox 30 News at 11. By now, the local media had got really interested in the story and were keen to see if they could encourage anyone who had information to come forward. It concerns the story of a classical composer, Frederick Delius, who came here about 100 years ago to Florida. He embraced the culture, the people, and the land, and he had an amazing experience here. He was heavily influenced by African-American music, and he took this away and made it into his own way of composition. We know from Delius's own correspondence and his friends at the time that he loved listening to the singing of his foreman and the other plantation workers. I discussed this with jazz musician Langenoux Parsons, who has made a special study of pre-blues music and the songs sung in this area in the 1880s. I wish I had my woman, she left me so long ago, she said she had to go. To find a life for herself And I feel so oh, 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 sad I feel so sad But I really want to see her again Maybe Fantastic. something like that. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So it's all based very much around one kind of, or one or two basic harmonies. That that first harmony you played, the the, the harmony of the, the primary key, and then the harmony of the fourth above that. Yes, which takes us back to uh, Africa because uh, in Africa there's not really such a strong harmonic uh, conception. Right. It's much more rhythmic and yes. melodic. So yes. that's why. Uh, instead of having a lot of different chords, what's important is more the fact that you have this rhythmic, yes. rhythmic consistency. It's, it's really interesting that you keep playing, playing that because there's many pieces of Delius that have exactly that rhythm. There's a bit in the third violin sonata where um, it's got this rhythm.